Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Developing a Test Strategy and Plan, brought to you by Nelson Laboratories in partnership with QMED. I'm Tanya von Grumkow, Program Manager at UVM Americas, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive. Each widget within the dock at the bottom of the console will open in a different window for you to view additional resources, speaker bios, and an overview of the webinar. There are several social media widgets for you to like, share, and talk about the content with your peers and communities. At the end of the program, we will ask you to complete a short survey. Please take a moment to fill this out. Your feedback will provide us with valuable information on the subjects covered in this webinar and how we can improve future events. You can also launch the survey at any time by clicking on the survey button at the bottom of the console. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the PDF labeled download slides located in the additional re resources widget. If you're experiencing any technical problems, please visit our help guide by clicking on the help widget. Now on to the presentation. Discussing today's topic will be Zora Rollins, biocompatibility expert, and Martel Winters, senior scientist at Nelson Laboratories. Martel, I now hand it off to you. Thank you, Tanya. This is a topic that uh, Thor and I find very interesting in that it it often ends up being, uh, if, if it's not quite done right, often ends up being a, a problem for people and, and we end up getting to having the opportunity to help them through it. So we're excited to be able to provide some thoughts and some guidance on, on how to best approach this. So the uh, just quick overview, we're going to talk about big picture test strategies and then get a little more detail on test plans. We'll talk about testing sequence and uh, the, the, the best or what your options are as far as uh, the sequence of tests go and then end up with biocompatibility considerations and some examples. So starting off with the test strategy and plan. So everybody wants to have a good interaction with the FDA. That, that's everyone's eventual goal. And the, the best way that, that we've seen to accomplish that goal is to have a, a very effective test strategy and to have that strategy established early in the process. We've found that when, it, when it's done that way, that it does facilitate a, a good interaction with the FDA. Now, the strategy and plan normally should be somewhat iterative, meaning that uh, in, initially you will create what you think is the proper strategy and plan, and based on input from experts or others in the industry, and then eventually, if you're doing it right, then feedback from FDA will also give you ideas on how to improve that. So then you go back and adjust the strategy and test plans as necessary. Now, I'm, first I'm going to cover a handful of things that we strongly recommend be addressed during product design. The times when we have, when we're working with people who are having the most problems, it's when these things are addressed after the design has been completed and somewhat set in stone. So you, you notice I underline during, and so that, that's I, I want to put a lot of emphasis on addressing these things during the design of the product. So the, the first thing to talk about is the, this desired sterilization method. With the knowledge of the sterilization method that you want to use, you can then more easily select appropriate materials. Now, sometimes the, you might have the materials that you select drive the sterilization method and that's appropriate as well, you know, compared to the option I'm providing here, which is that the sterilization method drives the materials. The problem is if you get too many materials and these more complex products we're seeing now, if you're not if you're not keeping sterilization at the forefront of your mind as you're going through this process, then you might end up with a product which is not able to be sterilized using using traditional methods. So an example, if I know that I'd like to irradiate a product. And as I'm going through the selection of materials, if I know that I could either use polypropylene or polyethylene, then based on our knowledge of, of the radiation compatibility of those materials, I would want to use polyethylene rather than polypropylene. However, uh, if I was using, a, if I wanted to use steam sterilization then, and could use those same materials, I would want to use polypropylene because of its ability to survive the, the uh, 
this, the high temperatures. Now, this type of information is available in an AMI document called AMI TIR-17, uh, Material Selection for Sterilization. It's a great document, a great resource for selection of materials. So the next thing, and these are not necessarily in any particular sequence, so another thing important to keep in mind during product design is uh, when you have an idea what your sterilization method is going to be, then also keep in mind the actual product design itself. The final design of some products can make it very difficult or very easy for the validation of the sterilization process, depending on, on how that ends up. For example, if you if you decided to use steam sterilization and if you selected materials that can be steam sterilized, then the next question to ask is, is the design of the product such that the steam can get everywhere that has patient contact, or are there areas which might have patient contact which are, which would occlude the steam? And we have these same questions for any type of gaseous sterilization, where it is important that there be access of the of the sterilant to all the important areas of the product. Another example with steam sterilization is uh, since steam is a heat-based uh, sterilization process. You want to look and see, do all the components conduct heat or are there insulators? Uh, perfect examples of those are we know that with some products that silicone handles are very comfortable to the user, but for steam sterilization uh, are a great insulator for heat and can make steam sterilization a, a challenge. Another thing to consider during the product design is also the biocompatibility of the product. And uh, again, this is another situation where, where uh, there might be two aspects to consider. There might be the material itself, whether the material is biocompatible. For example, if you want to use a latex stopper on, uh, on part of this device, uh, will it potentially cause issues with patient biocompatibility? Or also, there are issues with, with the process, and that the process might have impact on biocompatibility. So, Example of if you want to have a specific detergent in mind for cleaning, then uh, will that detergent residual, if there are any there, will that cause biocompatibility issues? So it's important not just to think sterilization and materials, but also start thinking process uh, along with this, this discussion of biocompatibility. Another thing to consider is how the product should be presented to the surgeon. So now we're getting more on the packaging side. The, the intended means of, of use from a surgeon's standpoint can help you to determine what the best packaging would be to make it easier for the surgeon to use. For example, if the surgeon will directly remove the product from the packaging and use it without any uh, without any other, any other changes needed, then a tray with a lid is good because a surgical technician can hold the tray and pull the lid back and the surgeon can easily remove the device. But uh, if the surgical techs need to perform, do some assembly or do some manipulations of the product prior, then a tray could work, but you could also use a pouch. And when that pouch is open, the pouch can provide an additional sterile surface uh, that the that the tech can use as they're performing those manipulations. Now, I've kind of covered the big picture issues that we see uh, causing the biggest problems, and in developing these these this strategy, the we like to emphasize that you involve experts in these discussions and in the development of this of these strategies. And uh, hopefully there's some some degree of expertise with some of this inf for some of this information, or perhaps all of it internally. But if not, then the time to get experts involved is during the process design, and not after. And we're talking about experts in topics like biocompatibility, uh, microbiology. So that would be industrial microbiology in sterilization, especially whichever method of sterilization you've selected, but you will likely need a, a good generalist in sterilization if you're, if you're selecting the sterilization method, and experts in packaging. Now, we're assuming that experts are already available for product design, and when we talk to customers, we, we nearly always see that they have great people involved in a product design, but sometimes what is lacking 
is these other experts to help the, the design people understand the best approach to take. Well, now you have your general strategy established, and now it's time to get a little more detailed and start putting together your test plan and then to write rationales. So the, the test plan means that now you're starting to get a little more, a little more specific on what types of tests and are going to be performed for each of the, these big ticket items like biocompatibility, sterilization, packaging, and, so, and shelf life. And right with those are, are determining what, what the rationales or which rationales need to be written and placed in the file. And this is where we see things most lacking with device companies is proper rationales established in the, in the design file. So an example of rationales, if you... Uh, if you decide that rather than some of the costly or lengthy biocompatibility animal studies that you might want to do material characterization instead, and that is becoming increasingly common, but it is not something that can be done lightly, and a well-written rationale is critical to be able to do that properly. Other topics, other examples would be product families for sterilization and, and a rationale to explain the approach taken and why those products can be part of the same family and then uh, expiry dates is another example. So with rationales, the reason we say that rationales are what we see lacking most uh, because it, think, think in your mind if any of these questions ring a bell to you. Things like someone asks, why are we doing it this way? And the answer is, well, that's what we've always done. Or another thing we hear is, well, I really have no idea. And and we always recommend when we have these discussions that customers go back and dig through the original files and see what they can find. And, and seldom is any rationale found to describe well, why certain decisions were made. So we strongly recommend that rationales be be put together. And not only is it good for for future use so that people five years down the road will understand why you made certain decisions, but you also learn a lot in writing those rationales because in the development of those rationales, you are thinking through all the various aspects that need to be considered. And, uh, and when it's done ahead of time, uh, many times the rationales are, are better written and, and you learn a lot about other things that you might need to address that you might not have considered previously. In our experience, some of the primary rationales that we see missing are things like, for example, a processing window or processing cycle for radiation or EO. So why was this, why was this uh, processing cycle established or why, was, why were these ranges established? Things like what was worst case for validation? So why did we select this product as opposed to some other product for validation purposes? When it comes to package testing, uh, for example, why did we select bubble emission and CO peel? And uh, in future testing, in all these examples, in future testing, it is often wise if things need to be repeated to repeat the same tests. But if it does not appear that the tests were selected properly, then then um, it can it can become difficult to understand how you know, what approach to take. What is the basis for the product family? So if I have an established family and I want to add products to that family, if I am, uh, if if I don't understand what the original rationale was, it can be very difficult to to add new products. Why don't we perform endotoxin testing? And another example would be why do we test this part of the vice and not other parts? These are all things. These are just examples, and I'm sure uh, as you think through this, you're probably thinking of other situations where if you were to go back and try to find why things were done that you will that there will not be information present. It's very common. Okay, so now we have the we've thought through everything. We have our rationale put together. We have some specific test plans established and we have rationales written. And now it's it's time to take this to FDA and try to get some good feedback from them. Now uh, Thor and I have both been in meetings with FDA personnel where they have repeatedly mentioned, you know, please let us provide you with feedback before you start doing testing and, and send in your, your submission. The, uh, so the, what we're saying here is the ask forgiveness rather than permission approach is really not a good approach with FDA interaction. 
So send in your submission. And there are a couple of approaches you can take in, in doing this with FDA. You can have an informal pre-submission discussion, and uh, the, the, that can give you quick feedback, but the problem is these are not binding if it's an informal discussion. You can also request what, what is called a Q-sub or a pre-sub uh, type of meeting, and those, the benefit to those is those are official, and FDA records the outcomes of that meeting, and so they are binding. And it's, it's a great way to get feedback and then go through your and, and make any necessary changes before you start spending money and time on testing. So now you're ready to test. Now, testing does take time, as you know. And this is another thing that we see uh, companies that, that sometimes don't t quite take advantage of, of doing things to accelerate the testing process. Now, some of this testing can actually be done in parallel. For example, the biocompatibility, the package validation, the shelf life, and sterilization validation, all of those can be done in parallel rather than in sequence. And uh, it needs to be done properly, and you are making some assumptions to do this. So as long as those assumptions you feel are safe, then that can be done. It can really save a lot of time. So as an example, let's say you've determined that you want to use radiation on a device, radiation sterilization, and uh, everything you've done before indicates that this product should be able to be sterilized at 25 kilogram minimum. So then you have a typical 25 to 40 kilogram dose range. So you say, well, is that a safe assumption? One way to, to determine, really the best way to determine if that's a safe assumption is to review any bioburden data. And if you don't have bioburden data, that can be easily and quickly determined to give you a basic idea. And that can help you understand that that indeed is a safe assumption. And second, uh, if you're, you look at the biocompatibility of the materials, many materials are fairly well characterized. And if you have a good understanding, if, if you're using all well-characterized materials, then uh, that helps you to feel better about the, about the ability to perhaps do some of these death tests together. And you also can't, you, you cannot only consider materials, you also need to consider the process. And if there might be anything in the manufacturing or cleaning processes that might cause bad compatibility problems, but those things can be assessed ahead of time. And in packaging, if you already, for example, if you've already used the same or similar packaging previously and you have a certain level of understanding that this packaging has worked well before, then that can help you to feel that that's a, that that's a safe assumption. So having made these, uh, gone through these, these assumptions and put together your thoughts and, and documented all of these, then you could do the test, this testing in parallel if it were, turns out well. So, for example, you can start the radiation validation. At the same time, you can go ahead and dose product at the upper end of your dose range, so 45 to 50 kilograms. And then with those product and packaging, begin the biocompatibility and the package validation and shelf life component. And with proper rationale, this really is a reasonable approach, and we've seen it done many times. Let's look at the difference in testing time now. So let's say you're doing a two-year shelf life for packaging, and it's a permanent contacting device. So if you test in parallel, the biocompatibility will likely be the longer of the, uh, of the tests that need to be performed, where you're looking at about 18 to 19 weeks. And if that's the case, then by that time, your, your sterilization validation and the packaging and shelf life validations are already completed. Now, if you do these in sequence, then the, the cumulative time that it takes to complete these tests is around 41 weeks of test time. So you can cut that down to half or a little bit better than half by thinking through this and doing these, uh, doing these in parallel. So I'm going to switch topics just a little bit and, and talk some now about, about microbiology, some specifics there. We're seeing a, a trend beginning in the industry. It's, it's been going for a few years now with both the device side, which is primarily driven by Amy and ISO, and by the pharma side, which is driven primarily by USP, uh, so it's coming from both arenas, that you really understand the product and the process microbiology. Not that you just have a handful of final reports that you've stashed away in a file somewhere, but that you truly understand what the microbiology data are telling you. So that means that 
that in developing your process and in selecting your raw materials, you need to be smart in dealing with the microbiology aspect of those. So, for example, uh, on the pharma side, with USP 61 and 62, which is the uh, the test for the it used to be called microbial limits, where you're it's for a non-sterile product, but it needs to be cleaned to some level. Uh, many years ago, the, the general approach was, well, as long as it as long as my product does not have these number of bad bugs that are established in USP, then I'm fine. But we're seeing increasing increasing scrutiny put not just on the absence of those bad bugs, but also are there any other microorganisms on the product that might be present in higher in, in high numbers? For example, if I have a different bug there at 3,000 CFU, it's not on the list of bad bugs, but but that 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 microorganism needs to be considered to determine if if it still might cause a potential problem. So this means that that from with regards to microbiology, there are a few important things to consider, and. Uh, one of them is looking at your component and material suppliers. So uh, what what we hear quite often when we're dealing with customers is when they are dealing with a microbiology problem on their finished product and we suspect it might be coming from one of the raw materials or one of the components, when we ask them, so, you know, which of these, which of these service providers or which of these uh, companies have you audited? And in most cases, what we hear is none of us have ever been there. And I, I, I'm not saying that you necessarily have to perform a microbiological audit and assessment of every single supplier, but certainly with a knowledge of the processes that your suppliers use and with a knowledge of which might be more critical to your finished product, it would be important to have a microbiological assessment done there and to have controls and agreements in place and to have very strict change control with these with these customers or with these suppliers to make sure that they're providing you with notifications of change. So in the manufacturing and assembly process, what this means there is that expertise needs to be available and time needs to be spent to really understand the, envi the environmental bio burden. Now, normally it's understood that there's no direct correlation between environmental bioburden and product bioburden. And as long as the environment remains under control, that is, that is nearly always the case. However, this is, is still important that, to, to understand the environmental bioburden as it is a component of your control process. And then to understand the product bioburden itself. For example, when starting up a brand new product line with new manufacturing processes, and new materials, uh, components, and, and it is not wise to do your, if you're using radiation, for example, not wise to do your radiation validation with product manufactured over a few days period of time and then do no additional testing until the time for the next dose audit. It is really important that you understand the product microbiology and establish a really good baseline of, of what that microbiology looks like, what that bioburden consists of, and looking at both numbers and types. And so testing more frequently during the initial stages of, of manufacturing helps you to understand what really is going on with your product with regards to microbiology. That's the end of, of my portion. I will now turn in the rest of the time over to Thor Rollins. Thank you, Martel. And I'm going to just piggyback on basically most things which Martel talked about in his presentation. And the reason why we kind of singled out biocompatibility testing is, like Martel mentioned in the beginning, biocompatibility can actually be one of the longest and most expensive portions of any preclinical testing scheme, um, particularly with uh, permanent implant devices. Um, that's where you see the biggest uh, length of time and, and cost associated with testing. So we kind of wanted to take some time to kind of go through how to evaluate your biocompatibility and maybe some tips and tricks on how to assess the need to perform biocompatibility and, and maybe using some chemistry to justify out of that, kind of like Martel mentioned earlier. Um, the first slide here we're going to be talking about, this is the uh, slide that I think most people are familiar with when you're talking about biocompatibility, and this can be 
somewhat confusing. Um, and so this is the slide out of ISO 10993-1 um, and FDA uh, G95, which basically helps predict what testing would be necessary to look at biocompatibility for a medical device. And it's broken down by body contact, contact duration, and, and once you determine your body contact and contact duration, then you can de determine what testing would be recommended for that product. When you're looking at the body contact of your device, you have three general categories. You have a surface device, you have external communicating, and then you have implant device. A surface device is anything that sits on the surface of the body. It's pretty self-explanatory. Where an external communicating device is a device that's inside the body and outside the body at the same time. Now, that's kind of a vague category, but the best examples are delivery devices for stents or uh, catheters or things of this na nature where the distal end of the device is inside the body and the proximal end is outside either with a handle or, or connected to something else and so uh, where por portions of the device are contacting the body. And then we have an implant device, which is located inside the body, implanted inside the body. Then we have subcategories to each one of these uh, general categories. For the surface device, we have skin, mucosal membrane, and breached or compromised surface, all pretty self-explanatory. For the external communicating device, we have uh, a couple subcategories that are a little confusing that I want to try to help uh, shed some light on. The first one is blood path indirect, and then you have tissue um, and you know, bone and dentine and then you have circulating blood. Now, a lot of people, when we talk about trying to categorize their device for them, when they're an external communicating device, for example, um, a surgical instrument is a good example of this, they, they want to classify it as a blood path indirect because the distal end of that surgical instrument is in a wound, um, and that wound has blood present, and there's blood interaction with the material, and so they categorize that falsely as blood path indirect. We uh, know that when you're in the tissue or in the bone, that there's going to be blood present. The, the question that you need to ask yourself, is that blood recirculated in the body? Because if you look at it, where we start looking at blood path indirect components, we start doing hemocompatibility testing. Now, hemocompatibility just looks at the compatibility with blood. How does your device interact with blood? Now, if that blood is just waste blood, if it's just going to be absorbed by the body, um, then we don't really care if it hemolysizes or if it causes a clot, um, where the, that becomes impactful when the device is actually in the circulatory system or has interaction with blood that is going to be in the circulatory system. So a good example of a blood path indirect external communicating device is an IV tubing set, where the IV bag itself is not contacting the body, it's outside the body, but any fluid that's in the bag is leaching uh, compounds or chemicals from the bag, and then it's getting delivered indirectly to the blood path. So uh, an IV bag would be an external communicating device because it's outside the body, but communicating with the body, um, blood path indirect, where the distal end of a delivery device for a stent would be circulating blood, and then anything in the tissue would be tissue bone. So that kind of helps uh, clear up, I think, that subcategory a little bit. And then for the implant device, we have tissue and bone and then blood contact. And then once we determine what body contact your device has, the next step is to determine how long of contact is in, uh, with that device in the body. And we have three categories there with the contact duration. We have A, which is less than 24 hours, B, which is 24 hours to 30 days, and then anything over 30 days is a permanent contact. This isn't just one exposure to the device. We are concerned about repeated exposure of a device. And with repeated exposure, we're meaning a device that is meant to be used over and over again in the patient. What we have to do is kind of predict the length of time it will be used and how often it will be used and add that time together to determine the total of contact duration. Each one of those contact durations then help us determine the testing that is needed. And on the top of that uh, chart, you get to see the different categories for the tests, uh, ranging from cytotoxicity all the way to carcinogenicity. Now, each, some of these categories only have one test that you have to perform. Others might have multiple tests, depending on each category and the requirements by the FDA. But this will at least allow you to start to develop a test plan, like, like Martel mentioned, to be able to determine what biocompatibility endpoints are needed. Now, 
in the past, this chart has always been seen as kind of a checkbox mentality, where it's like, okay, I need to do the big three, the cytotoxicity, sensitization, irritation, check, check, check. Or um, I need to do these five tests, check, 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 check. And the latest draft that was released about a year and a half ago from the FDA, um, it, it mentions in there that this is not meant to be a checkbox. As Martel mentioned in his presentation, we're, the biocompatibility is, is progressing towards more of a scientific approach to these categories. So what we're saying is that these endpoints should be evaluated. That evaluation could be testing, um, or it could be that you need to evaluate the risk of your certain device and the materials and the processing involved to that endpoint. Uh, a good example is this sensitization. You know, sensitization is an endpoint for all these devices. It's one of the big three. There are very few materials or processes that are true sensitizers. And so if you are using a, a very simple device with very simple processing, it may be appropriate to address this concern by looking at the potential of the materials and processes to elicit a sensitization response. And if you can find uh, substantial proof that you are not in, uh, using a sensitizer in your product, then that might be the approach that you take instead of performing the sensitization test. So just performing the actual test is not necessarily the option that you have to perform, that we can just evaluate each endpoint by different means. So with that implant driver, we look at it as classified as an external communicating device because the surgeon is holding on to the, the proximal end of the driver and the distal end is in the, in the body. And then it has contact with tissue bone dentine and hopefully less than 24 hours if it's used correctly. Um, and so you're looking at that testing category there for the implant driver. The next uh, device we're going to kind of go through to show you is the actual screw itself. So we looked at the driver. Once again, we have to look at the screw independently from the driver. So for the screw, it would be an implant device. It would be bone and it would be permanent. Now, one thing you have to think about is in this case, let's say it's a permanent contacting screw. Well, yes, it's titanium or, or stainless steel or something along those lines. Then we would be permanent greater than 30 days. Um, most screws are that way. Even biodegradable screws would take longer than 30 days to absorb into the body most of the time. But let's just say, for argument's sake, that you have a material that would degrade in 14 days. Well, then your contact type, um, if you could show through testing or through evaluation that that's your duration of test uh, dwell time, then you would evaluate it for a, less, uh, a prolonged contact instead of a permanent contact. The next one we're going to look at is a condom. And the reason I put the uh, condom up here is because most people would classi classify the, uh, a condom as a surface device. Um, either mucosal membrane, um, that's usually what's classified as in less than 24-hour contact. So you're looking at the big three. And that's a very common test strategy for condoms. Um, the reason I have this uh, device example in here is it's been about eight or nine years ago that we had a regulatory agency. Uh, and I was on the phone with this, this regulatory agency, so I, I can promise you it happened, um, with a condom test strategy. And the regulatory representative uh, from this uh, body, notified body, um, actually said that uh, someone could buy a bulk uh, example of this condom and use the same brand of condom every day for more than 28 days in a row. And she wanted to classify this as not as a short-term contact, but as a, actually a permanent contacting device based on its multiple exposure in the body. Now, that's not common for condoms. Most of the time, they are just the big three. But I put this example in here to show you that that because this is a good example of a reason why we need to, to kind of give our test plan to the FDA or any notified body beforehand, because even though we may all agree that a certain device sits in the category, it doesn't mean that uh, your notified body will also agree on that. So kind of running through this test scheme with them beforehand will help get away from any risk that may be there from a disagreement with the categorization. The last one that we're going to talk about is an oxygen tube. And in this particular real-life scenario, the oxygen tube was hooked to an oxygen tank that uh, was not supplied by the, the, the sponsor of the tube, and then it was hooked up to a sleep apnea mask. So they did not make the mask either. They just manufactured the tube. Now, at this, and this was a couple years ago also, they were expecting to do no testing since it did not have contact with the patient. Um, we 
convinced them to do the big three um, as a precaution based off of contact with the body, the skin, or whatever it may be. Now, the um, FDA in this case came back and uh, told them that this oxygen tube should be classified as an external communicating device because the oxygen can mimic uh, liquid extract that be pulling compounds from the plastic into the patient's uh, respiratory system, specifically lodging particulates into the lungs. And so they wanted to see implantation and some um, sub uh, subchronic toxicity. This is actually something that we see very commonly nowadays with oxygen tubes or, or ventilators or other things that are uh, gas path, especially heated gas path devices. The FDA is considering these gas path devices as external communicating devices based off the fact that they could be delivering chemicals to the body. So just another example of how we may disagree sometimes, or, or I don't want to say disagree necessarily, but look at things differently from a regulatory body on how a device is categorized, and um, that's why it's important to kind of address those beforehand. Now, very quickly, looking at how we want to go about with the testing plan, the very important part of a biocompatibility testing plan is a sample preparation. The reason I say that is because once we get an extract of a device or once we start to test a device, those tests are done almost exactly the same no matter what lab you use across the world. They're very standardized testing that's been around for decades. Where variability arises is with the sample preparation. And so you have to pay special attention to how the device is going to be prepared and make sure that that portion of your protocol or your test proposal is written very well. And that's where you need to address or have a conversation with an expert in the industry to make sure you're addressing every endpoint you need to for sample preparation. The example I'm going to give you today is the difference between surface area and weight and the impact that those two, which are both in the ISO 10993-12, which is the standard for sample preparation, both are valid um, ways to address sample preparation for a medical device in that standard. So you get to choose one or the other. Now here we have a partial knee implant made out of titanium and hard plastic, a very common kind of device. If we look at it by the weight ratio in the standard, by, by using the mass to determine how we're going to test the device, this device weighs 93.9 grams. And the ratio in the standard is 0.2 grams per mil. So if we extract this device per that weight standard, we would extract it in almost 500 mils of media. So we would put this device into almost half a liter, um, or excuse me, 500 mils of media, and let's see what chemicals might come off the device and test that liquid. If we use the surface area method to do the device testing, then this surface area is 115.8 centimeters squared. So using the correct ratio in the standard, we would add almost 40 mils of extraction fluid. So the same device, the same standard we're following, um, gives us totally uh, different volumes of media that we would extract in. So by weight, we would add 500 mils. By surface area, we would only add 40. What that means is if we do it by surface area, then we have a 12 times more concentrated extract than we do by weight, which means it's a way worse case for testing. And for this reason, the FDA prefers surface area over weight. And if you ever do a device by weight, be prepared to try to justify why you chose weight as your, as your method of testing. It's a very hard justification to make. We've done it before. There's certain ways we can look at it, but uh, it's better just to do surface area. So please pay close attention to preparation on a device because this is where you're going to probably have the most um, questions risen. Another example of this is once we find out how much volume to add to the device, the next thing we have to determine is how long and at what temperature we, we extract it. So the extraction will pull off those chemicals off the materials and the residuals off the device to test. And we could put it in at 37 degrees, which is, this is all Celsius. So 37 degrees Celsius is body temperature, or we could put it in for 121 degrees uh, for one hour. And each one of these extraction parameters are in the ISO 10993. Now, besides cytotoxicity, which uh, with cytotoxicity, you have to extract at 37 degrees for 24 hours uh, because of the, the test method itself. Other than that, the temperature is very important to regulatory bodies, specifically the FDA. The FDA likes to see 50 degrees for 72 hours. Uh, they want to see, especially if your device has longer than 72-hour contact with the body, because we want to elevate that temperature to see a worst-case 
exposure if your device has more than 72 hours. So to conclude, the test strategy and test plan are a critical step in any device uh, test, plan, uh, test strategy. And as Martel mentioned earlier, it is important to have competent people that, in, involved in that test plan setup before you submit it to a regulatory agency for either review or if you want to submit it for testing itself. You have rationales in place for all these endpoints when you're looking at uh, preclinical testing. Make sure you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, Mike Bartel said so many times we hear, well, that's what we've always done, or I have no idea why we chose this, this, this method. Please make, take the time to put those rationales in place. It's a great educational piece for you, and any other person going along will look at your scientific rationale and why you chose each endpoint. And please obtain regulatory body involvement. I've talked to, I've talked to FDA, I've talked to Japan, I've talked to um, uh, notified bodies in Europe, and all of them have expressly uh, recommended that they get uh, involved in this process early. They'll be able to get feedback before you do expensive and long-term tests. Thank you so much for your time today, and uh, here's our contact information if you have any questions or any um, uh, need any help with this evaluation. And uh, now we'll go ahead and turn the time over to Tanya for uh, the rest of the time. Thank you, Thor and Martel, uh, for the value information on developing a test strategy and plan. Uh, for upcoming webinars and for the archive of this webinar, please visit QMED.com. This webinar is copyright 2015 by QMED. The presentation materials are owned by or copyright by Nelson Laboratories. The individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of QMED and our sponsors, Nelson Laboratories, thank you for attending and have a great rest of your day.